This is Gene Montrose-Stilling. Welcome to the Tapping Q&A podcast, recorded live to tape from Williamsburg in Brooklyn. This is episode 241, originally aired October 5th, 2016. Hi, everyone. I hope this finds you well wherever you are and whatever time of day you're getting a chance to listen to this. Thanks for spending a little time with me today. Before we jump into today's great interview, just three quick housekeeping notes. First, if you have not done so already, I would really, really encourage you to go back and listen to last week's podcast. It was on creating helpful and healthful boundaries. In looking at the statistics, fewer than normal people have downloaded it. And I think that might be because of the title, that it doesn't sound like it's something that might be appealing. But everyone who listened to it has given me really, really positive feedback. And so I'd really encourage you to listen to it. It's very short. There's a great tap along that's included. I've also included in the archive page the script. So if you want to print out the tapping script and take it with you, it will make your day easier. It will make you feel better if you go through that very, very short process. If you go to tappingqandapodcast.com and just click on the link for episode 240, which was last week's episode, you can get that absolutely free. If you've already downloaded the Tapping Q&A app, you will notice that there's two entries for last week. One is the full podcast. The other is the text of the tapping script. So right there in the app, you can click on it, pull the script up, and tap along to it. Again, they're absolutely free. If you haven't downloaded the app yet, you can also do that at tappingqnapodcast.com. It's available for both Android and Apple devices. Second, if you haven't downloaded or signed up for the 10-part guide for using EFT to stop self-sabotage, it's absolutely free. It's on the website. If you go to tappingqna.com, big blue button right there at the top of the page. If you are listening to this podcast in your web browser, in the right-hand column, up at the top, big blue button, every two or three days, you will receive an audio or a video or an article or a tapping script that's going to help you in a very simple way to use tapping to eliminate self-sabotage. The reason I broke it up into those parts is so you're not overwhelmed with information. You're just getting a little bit at a time so it is useful and you can actually implement it. And finally, don't forget, we have a special deal set up by our friends at Pain Relief Miracle, who are the sponsor of the Tapping Q&A podcast. With your first order, you will get 33% off that first order. I just gave a bottle away to a friend. They were super excited. They were passing through town. They were on their way out of the country, and they knew that they were going to be having all sorts of blisters on their feet as they hiked all over Europe. It is in my medicine cabinet. It should be in yours as well or it should be in your backpack if you're about to hike all over Europe. Go to tappingqna.com slash pain. You'll get 33% off your first order. Lots of podcasts, when they have sponsors, they say only for my listeners, and it's not true because it's the same discount that the advertiser uses over and over and over again. This is true. This is the only place you can receive that 33% discount, tappingqna.com slash pain. Today, we have a conversation with Rick Wilkes, who is one of the most frequent guests on the podcast, and the reason that is the case is I love Rick's disposition, I love his worldview, I love what he has to share. Today, we have a conversation about, it ultimately comes down to a conversation about fear and love, and how do we move away from fear and move into a place of love, and the reason we have that struggle is it is our genetic heritage that we are disposed to fear. It's the reason why our ancestors survived big, scary animals. It's the reason why we're able to navigate the streets every day and get out of the way of cars speeding at us. It's because the first signal that you hear and overrides every other signal in your life is fear, which is great. It keeps us safe. But if it is misinformed and it is disproportionate, it makes it really difficult for us to be in a state of anything that is not fear. So here is my conversation with one of my favorites, Rick Wilkes, on love, fear, and the primitive brain. I live in New York City, um, which is an amazing place. And it's really interesting how isolating New York can be because environmentally, it's a really difficult place to live. We're just on top of each other. There's so much noise. There's, and, and so because of that, people just kind of walk through the day and walk through their world with their shields up as a defense mechanism. Because if you were an open vessel all the time here, it would be really easy to be run over. 
And at the exact same time that it's doing that, it's created a city of a lot of people who just feel disconnected, who are longing for real, genuine, true connection with others. And we spend our days walking past people who are longing for the exact same thing that we are longing for, and we just pass each other by and continue to long for that. In your experience, what are the obstacles, the blocks, or the fears that prevent people from being in a place where they can just have true, genuine connection with others? You described it so vividly. We're walking down a a street or in an environment which is isolating. It's just a lot of people, a lot of energy, a lot of noises, everything else. And there's a part of us, Gene, that Called, I call it our primitive brain, mm-hmm. and that incorporates a lot of different parts of the biological brain. But it essentially is the part of us that wants to stay safe and sane <laughs> as the prime directive. Um, things like true connection, eh, that doesn't matter as much if we're not safe and, and sane and balanced. And so the primitive brain throws the shields up and says, oh, okay. And to me... The first thing is recognizing for all of us that there, are, that there is this dynamic going on, that that is a good and healthy thing. There's nothing wrong with having our shields up in the same way that it's a lot nicer to walk on a, a gravel walkway through a beautiful garden, sometimes with shoes on rather than with bare feet if the rocks are jagged. It just allows us to relax more. Oh, I've got these shoes on. And... Yet there's also times where we might want to take off our shoes and stand in the grass and feel the earth, feel the coolness, feel the aliveness. We want to, if you've ever tried to go swimming with your shoes on, it's like, really? This is uncomfortable. This weighs me down. The primitive brain needs encouragement. And by recognizing that this is a part of us, with a good and and useful aspect and consciously recognizing, well, how much shield do I, is right for me right here? Do I want to keep my shoes on when I go swimming or kissing? Or is it okay to be more open? Because some people do carry that shield into holding hands. They they carry it into kissing. They carry it into how they engage with others. Um, and so we're at a point where you and I are really attracted to emotional technologies like tapping and tapping as a way of connecting people. For me, if my shields are still on when I'm about to go on a date, it doesn't mean that I'm going to get necessarily naked, but if we're sticking our feet in the pool or the stream and splashing around a little bit, I do want to take my shoes off. And tapping allows us to retune ourselves, to get the excess amount of vigilance recalibrated, brought back under it, brought back to a place where we can be um, more open in safe and sane ways. And, and hearing you say that, two things strike me. One, I think it's really important to point out, and I am always doing it when I'm working with myself and doing it when I'm working with clients, is recognizing this idea that the issues that we have, that we'll call issues, I'll we'll put that in quotes, um, exist because it's a part of our system that's trying to take care of us. And it might be working in a disproportionate way, and it might be working in a misinformed way. And just this initial acknowledgement that these shields, these barriers, these walls that we are putting up, particularly when we're seeking relationship, um, are existing in a way to keep us safe. And by acknowledging that, it makes it less of a struggle. I'm no longer battling with this thing inside of me. I'm now working with this thing inside of me, trying to get it to a place that's healthier. The other thing in what you're talking about that strikes me, and I've seen this really recently a lot, is how much, particularly kind of on a subconscious level, we fall into an all or nothing disposition because it takes so much less mental energy to make things all or nothing that 
processing and dealing with nuance takes a lot of energy on a brain level. And so we're disposed to not do that. And when we're dealing with the subtleties of relationships, no two relationships are alike. And there is a lot of nuance on that. And there might even be nuance from this moment to the next and how I'm dealing with that and how it's our natural instinct to push away from that nuance, but how important it is for us to be in a place to recognize that nuance so we can have the connection that we really want. Oh, yeah. And this word nuance, and we feel the energy in it, all or nothing, if somebody is in all or nothing, it means that they're in their primitive brain Mm -hmm. because the primitive brain makes all or nothing association. All snakes are terrible. All snakes are a threat to my existence. That's the primitive brain's first kind of association. All men are predators. That's a kind of primitive brain association. Logically, we may know that it's not true, but there are enough people out there that have experienced predatory men that as I walk down the street, I can feel their primitive brains doing an all or nothing. Oh, male predator, move away, freeze. So the good news is, is that we can start recognizing that if I, if, if I or my date or my friend or my business partner who I love is in all or nothing, it means they're in their primitive brain. And my only job is to see if we can soothe and calm things down so that the person can feel safe enough not to do an all or nothing on the other side of it, but to have nuance. If if I'm in a relationship with someone and I'm really in a relationship with their primitive brain, it's not going to be very pleasant. That's the, that's the traditional love-hate relationship. If somebody has a love-hate relationship in their life, essentially it's a primitive brain relationship. That's as simple as it gets. It's all or nothing. There's very little nuance. It's I love you. I hate you. I want to be with you. I want you to get out of the, this world and go jump off a cliff. That's primitive brain trying to make sense. It, And just recognizing as I walk in the world and I hear people dialoguing and talking to other people, even talking to their children, if they're in all or nothing, I go, oh, they're in primitive brain, which we all have. It can't be surgically removed. It can sometimes be glazed over. For example, someone who's typically in their primitive brain may find that if they drink a lot of alcohol, suddenly that nothing becomes an all, Mm -hmm. you know, the primitive brain's ability to have a shield and block, um, gets diminished with drugs and alcohol. Okay. So people now go from an experience of having none of what they want in their life to having essentially just like everything is lubed up to the point where they don't have any good boundaries. They don't even have brakes on the car. And then when that, that wears off, Now they're back again in their primitive brain, actually with more evidence, more evidence that the nothing was, is a better idea. And that's the progressive kind of shutting down that we see, you know, I let, I opened up a little bit, oftentimes, you know, sometimes because of substances and sometimes because there's trust, um, and I love the fact that someone can come to you if they have their primitive brain really making them overly shielded and help recalibrate to a place which has nuance. It's not an all or nothing. It's not like, oh, I'm not dating anyone. Oh, I have to date everyone. That still means primitive brain. You can help them get to a place where it's like, yeah, I'm, I can... I can have boundaries. I can have breaks in the car, which is a good thing. I can feel for my vulnerabilities and soft raw spots without leaping to all or nothing. So then how do we, once we recognize the fact that 
you know, this a very all or nothing disproportionate sin is existing in our own life, not in someone else we recognize around us, but when we recognize it in ourselves. After that, that moment of recognition and revelation, what are then the steps that create the capacity for us to be able to traffic in that nuance, which allows us to make different choices moment to moment? What I do is, as you know, I'm a tapper. Um, I make it ridiculous. I make the all or nothing ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So if I'm feeling that, um, I don't know, there's so many ways that one per that people are unsafe. People don't care. Even though nobody in this whole planet is a caring person and I should just go and hide under my bed and I'll put some intensity into it. Mm -hmm. Why would I do that? Because there is also a part of us that can help saying, yeah, but what about, what about Kathy? Yeah. Or, or what about that time when the nuance starts coming in, but oftentimes the primitive brain has to find its voice. Truly one of the things that I love most about tapping as an emotional technology is that you give the primitive brain a voice. Mm -hmm. You're not saying that this is the absolute truth, but if my primitive brain is freaking out and I give it voice while stimulating myself in a comforting way, <sighs> That gets the circuits moving in a different way. That literally the brain circuitry starts to reevaluate. It's not forcing it. You're not forcing yourself from to go from nothing to all or all to nothing. You're really opening up the possibility. You're creating a gap for nuance, for compassion, for acceptance, and healthy boundaries. That is not a function of the primitive brain. It just wants to keep you safe. And it's choices are really limited fight flight or freeze <laughs> yeah and and i you know I, I really appreciate what you're saying there about you know bringing that sense of the primitive voices the primitive brain's voice to give it full voice that there have been a number of times in my own life and working with clients even without tapping just as we're doing a little investigation when the instant they give their primitive the belief that the primitive brain has about a circumstance voice, it's almost like it recognizes once it's in the light of day, how ridiculous it is and recalibration starts to happen. And that doesn't happen all the time. And that's why we have these other emotional technologies, but sometimes just the simple acknowledgement of, Oh, there's a part of me that believes this. I'm going to say it out loud. Boy, how ridiculous is that? The system's able to let it go very quickly because even the system recognizes, oh yeah, this is probably extreme in a way that is no longer useful or helpful for me. Mm -hmm. And there's a, such a difference, isn't there, between the energy of suppression, suppressing something because you wouldn't be a good person if you ever said something mm -hmm. like that. And as you describe it, giving it voice. And once the energy is out, well, guess what? It's not just the primitive brain that now is hearing it. You're hearing it in your, in your ears. You've got it mirrored by someone who, who can reflect back to you and be present with this without judgment. Um, and the recalibration off, I think recalibration is the most natural thing for our consciousness to do, mm -hmm. unless it's suppressed, unless we're frozen because of past traumas and experiences that we've had. If we're really in all or nothing, I have a lot of compassion for that. And I know that unless we help someone get out of all or nothing, then their behaviors are coping behaviors. Their love relationships are going to be struggles for protection and energy and resources, resources rather than a place of relaxed, natural generosity, intimacy, connection, appreciation. And as you use that word suppress, I, I just keep thinking, you know, that it, at least in my experience, that fully articulated emotions are short lived. 
they're, 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 they're trying to get our attention. They're trying to point something out. You know, frustration is pointing out things aren't going well. Fear is pointing out danger. Anger is pointing out attack. And it's almost as if the moment that that emotion gets heard, and then it goes, okay, I've been heard. I've done my job. And, and it gives us this opportunity to have the emotion deflate because it's done what it's supposed to. I'm like, yes, I see that you are really scared of this particular thing. You are scared of rejection. You are scared of judgment. I hear that and I appreciate that. I'm going into this with my eyes wide open and how it's almost like, okay, I've done my job. I've pointed out the danger. You can go out into the world now. And it makes it easier for us to navigate when we are willing to just be honest with what we're experiencing as that first step. There's a part of me that's really scared. There's a part of me that's really overwhelmed. There's a part of me that's really desperate. There's a part of me that fears this is never going to happen to me because I'm unlovable. And giving ourselves a chance to stop suppressing that fear gives us an opportunity to kind of dive in and address it in some way. I do believe that there's a component here that the primitive brain, um, if, if we're loving our primitive brain and loving others that have primitive brains and have clients that have primitive brains and we have a primitive brain, what you described about giving voice, I, I observe that people do give voice to their primitive brain. Let's say that they complain about something. Mm -hmm. Now, if the response that they get back is other people complaining or being angry with them in an all or nothing way, it's what the primitive brain to me picks up is, oh, we're at war. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're on my side or you're against me. Right. It really is that energy. The safe space is what you described there where there's room for someone to give voice to it without necessarily it's setting the room on fire right. <laughs> or setting passions ablaze of um, it's giving it voice and then seeing what is the natural way that evolves from that. The mm -hmm. primitive brain, one of, like we said, one of the things that it wants to do is fight. Another thing that it wants to do is flee. And also it can freeze in, in a sense of despair. There's nothing we can do about it. Oh, what's the use? And if I give voice to my primitive brain and the three people that are in the room with me go, yeah, what's the use? We're powerless here. There's no, nothing we do will ever make a difference. Well, my primitive brain really makes an all or nothing dis discernment there. That's very different than... What I'm encouraging people in a loving, safe way is, oh, I'm hearing, I'm hearing that you feel really powerless here. Um, and in a, in a coaching relationship, we can go deeper, you know, with where do you feel that? I, but even just giving a reflection back of I'm hearing that, or I imagine that that must be really frustrating for you. Little ways that we're learning as human beings to come back into what is also a very natural thing, which is our primitive brain have, it, have picked up on an energy and it's time to recalibrate. It's time to come back so I can graze in peace. It's time to come back so I can dance with freedom and ecstasy rather than continuing to contract, isolate keep my shields up even, you know, wearing the astronaut suit to bed is not a way to have great sex, you know, it, and yet how many people walk around town with an astronaut suit on energetically? Mm -hmm. So what then, what then do you recommend for someone who's not in a circumstance where they're working with a coach of some sort? And because we're, you know, we're notoriously bad eyewitnesses to our own experience because how close we are to it. Um, but say someone's in a circumstance where they don't feel like they have the support around them, but want to investigate and clear some of this. What's, what, what are some other ways that folks could do that individually? Yeah. So I'm a big believer for me in putting things in writing, but to have a structure. Mm-hmm. The structure for me is to have a question, a, 
an empowering question that I'm answering. So one question is, is this situation feel like all or nothing? Yes. What about it makes it all or nothing? Do I want to fight, flight, or freeze? Mm -hmm. (laughs) What does this remind me of from my past? And is this really the same situation? Where do I feel this all in my body? And as soon as you notice it in your body, putting a comforting hand, like if you said, man, I, this is just killing my neck. I, I, I could just feel this tension in my neck and jaw. I might ask, Gene, can, would you like me to just put my hand on your neck and your jaw? Would that help, help you? And touch is a fundamentally comforting thing when it's done in a safe way. So we t- we've gotten out of the habit of touching ourselves for comfort. Mm-hmm. We will touch ourselves when it's like, oh, God, it hurts so much versus, you know, I have this neck of mine that carries around my head. And, man, I would look so funny without this neck. Thank you, neck. And I just just place, placing your hand on your neck, feeling, palpating like it's your best friend. That sends a signal directly into your primitive brain that it doesn't have to keep running fighting, freezing, conscious touch of yourself. So you're writing down these things to get them to give voice. I encourage people also, if you need, like I will sometimes write and say the words as I'm writing them down. Other times I will write it out and then read it aloud. I've been known to read into a voice recorder on my phone and then listen to my own voice. I'll just switch gears before I play back the recording. I pretend that pretend is a good word, that it's that my best friend has just sent me a, a voice message and I want to listen to him. There's something going on for him. And I think one of the things I like in in those suggestions is this idea of Nothing that you talked about there was diagnostic. Nothing that you talked about there was about trying to find the exact root cause. There were some questions that were provocative. What does this remind me of? But I think that sometimes we get so focused on trying to come up with the solution to the problem that we can work through um, that just being gentle with ourselves and acknowledging the experience in a lot of the ways that you just mentioned right there is is really soothing uh, to, to the point that as you were describing that reflexively, my right hand went up and just started rubbing the back of my neck. <laughs> and there was just this huge wave of relaxation that came with that. And it wasn't, I was kneading on the knots in my neck. I mean, literally it was just setting it and just gently sliding it down the back of my neck. And there was a huge amount of relief that came with that. And that was not a diagnostic move. It was just a move of self care and appreciation and how, it doesn't have to necessarily be a process sometimes for me to us to be going through it, just recognition and being gentle with ourselves in that process. Yeah, gentleness, uh, the kind of presence that you described, it is, a, it is the reason it's a very strong signal to our primitive brain is that it means that we're safe enough to take a moment to pay attention to our needs. Mm. If you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, you climb up the tree before you even think about your broken leg. Yeah. And yet there is a point after which the saber-toothed tiger is gone that you can attend to your needs and you can quiet your system down. And human bodies know how to do that. And I think we've stayed in a state of arousal, primitive brain arousal. I think a lot of our schooling is toward getting people to fight to be the best, fight to um, to achieve, fight not to be a failure. You know, there's so much fight or flight in our culture that it's an act of beautiful recalibration to think in terms of soothing. And truly, if I have a client that says, I'm so broken, I, I have to be fixed, that's a primitive brain. You're not broken. You don't need to be fixed. You may 
be in the process of recalibrating and retuning, there may be things that physiologically are going in a direction that you're not happy with. That's see, Notice that my language is being nuanced. We don't th- tend to, to use nuanced language. And yet, if we're using very all or nothing kind of language, it, it activates us. Anything that's presented as all or nothing, whether it's, um, if you don't have sex with me, you don't love me. That's all or nothing. There's no nuance to that. And it's ridiculous. Right. Anyone who's been in a relationship for long enough knows there are times when nobody feels like doing things. And yet, if your primitive brain is triggered because you feel something, okay, is this all or nothing? Yes. What am I feeling? I'm feeling rejected. I'm feeling blah, blah, blah. I feel like, you know, I can't do anything about it. I don't know what to do with this. Okay. Where do you feel that? Well, I feel it in my groin and I feel it in my heart and my throat and I can barely talk. And you start using your hands to touch those areas. And then you go, yeah, okay, I'm all right. This isn't a threat. Uh, And from there, you're back into a love relationship with yourself, your own body, and with other people, too. Um, I find myself when I don't know what else to say and I'm struggling with something is just to just tap and just say, I give myself permission to be easy and gentle with myself. I give myself (laughs) permission to be easy and gentle with myself. Yeah, I like that one so much. You know, and it gets because it's just it's just it's not a value judgment about anything that's going on. It's just saying, okay, I'm going to give you enough space to just kind of figure out where you need to stand right now. And sometimes, you know, especially, you know, when for me that that, you know, in the fight, flight or freeze, for me, the the freeze state is the hardest one to transform because fight or flight have action and movement to them. And it gives me the ability to redirect those things. You know, I'm already expelling energy in fighting back or running away, and I can redirect that into something productive. When I'm freezing, I am just stuck like a statue, and it's really – there's nothing to redirect because I'm just locked in this spot, and I'm just standing still not to be noticed until the danger goes away. And for me, at least that's the hardest part to move out of. What's your experience with things like that? I think it shows also in why a lot of people find that tapping doesn't help with, quote, depression. A lot of depression is a freeze response. There's a despair and a despondency energy. There's not much moving. And your your experience of whether someone's in fight or flight, there's energy moving. Um, It's much easier when someone's got a fire burning to put it into a fireplace instead of burning down the house than it is if they're cold and wet and covered in wool blankets and can barely lift a finger for Mm -hmm. them to get warm. And easy and kind, even asking the question, how, how might I be just a little kind to myself? Easy, a little easier with myself right now. Um, that can help bring us out of a freeze response. I, I even ask questions like, is gravity at least working? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, thank God. Gravity yeah. is working. Yeah. And that, that once you get some energy moving, if you're, if you're giving yourself permission, that word permission, Gene, uh, it, that opens up so much energy doors if we're giving ourselves permission to be right here right now. Oh. And, and it's funny you talk about, you know, recognizing gravity still working. I do the exact opposite. I'm always like, and no baby seals died. <laughs> you know, and, instead of talking about the things that are working, it's like, okay, what's the most extreme ridiculous thing that could be going wrong? Okay, that is not happening right now. You know, the city is not flooding. No baby seals have died. Okay. I, I can now kind of recalibrate that. 
Um, and I use that so much. There are some of my clients are like, yes, I know no baby seals died. And you can just see them kind of resetting themselves with that little reframe. Like, okay, great. It's not as bad as it feels. Yeah. Well, and, and sometimes that you see that acting where people are trying to recalibrate, but mm -hmm. they're taking in too much of the, the baby seals not dying and their brain starts looking for reasons. Right. Um, this is part of self-knowledge for each of us. What, what it is it that brings us out of that helpless, frozen state? Um, for me, I know that if I'm really sluggish, that there's music that I can choose. Yep. I have a menu of a playlist of different types of music that are the, okay, if I'm listening to this, chances are energy is going to start moving yep. for me. And that... Once you get the energy moving, now you've got got some capacity to do something with it. And I think the thing that's really important to recognize that as we get energy moving and we start changing, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're changing from bad to good, but we're changing from where we are to better. You know, the 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 idea that you talked about how 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 stuck being depressed can be. Oftentimes, when we are feeling better from depression, the place that we land is anger. Mm -hmm. And no one's going to, you know, most of the time we're not going to say anger is a great emotion. I'm glad I am in anger. <laughs> but, you know, going from depressed with it, which is lethargic on the couch, head under the covers to anger, I'm now fighting back with the world. That is an energetic improvement. It's not where we want to stop. It's not where we want to land. But this idea that as it's a process of transformation, it's not even – even the transformation process is not an all or nothing process that it's something that happens in steps in degrees and for us to be able to recognize that because if i'm working from a place of you know it is not better until it is perfect then everything up to that moment is a failure even if it's way better than it once was and there's so much more life here than there was before as long as it's not perfect then i have failed Yes, yeah, the all or nothing. Yeah, and it's easy for us not only to see the world in all or nothing, but the way that we're traversing this once we recognize what is wrong, that we can turn our transformation process into an all or nothing process as well. Yeah. And just going back to love and the primitive brain, to me, the energy of connection between people, uh, co-creating the experience of being on a street, co-creating the experience of being... Um, partners in business or even just sharing a line at the grocery store. The more that we are not in our primitive brain, the primitive brain is always going to be active, but it allows us to calibrate and say, yeah, I'm safe here. Yeah, I'm actually surprisingly safe here. I'm actually, yeah, this is good. This is a store filled with food. And yeah, <laughs> look at my basket. What an abundance. Um, the more that we can get to a place where the primitive brain signal is green light, you're safe ish, you know, cause it's not safe is not all or nothing. It's mm -hmm. nuanced. Right. And once we get to that place, now our interactions can be different. It does not mean that we need to suddenly or have to have to be this outgoing, friendly person you know, uh, introducing ourselves to everyone in the grocery line. What it can mean is that I feel that this person behind me has had a terribly rough day and is strained and they're feeling impatient. And I'm grateful that my life right now, I don't, I don't feel those things. I can let them go ahead of me. And even I'm grateful that I'm in that place, whether they acknowledge and are grateful for me letting letting them go in front of me or not, I can offer, I can invite them to be a little closer to their destination and feel some support, whether they let it in or not. I can notice the mother whose impatient child is feeling like he's all stressed and grumpy. And I can notice her stroking the top of his head. Even though he's crying, I can feel into, his crying's not triggering my primitive brain. I'm not annoyed. I don't feel like I want to scream at them to shut up or run out of the store and leave my basket. Very primitive brainy kind of reactions. I can be in a place of appreciation. Um, that 
utterly changes our interaction. We become a beacon of energy that is softer, easier. It's more natural. Um, yeah, fight and flight are natural too. But if we're cultivating an ecosystem, an emotional ecosystem, which is more nourishing for all of us, less isolating, more opportunity for connection, those are going to be soft and easy things. They're going to start with the soft and easy things, the seeds of connection. Gratitude and appreciation don't have to be big, flashy things. They can be just a, a recognition inside of ourselves. And I think it's it's such a huge thing when we get to the place where it doesn't have to be a huge, flashy thing. Yeah. So when we recognize that those small things are the things that, when they add up, make such a radically huge difference in our daily lives, in our experience, and in the experience of the people around us, that 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 it makes the trans at least for me it makes the transformation process so much more easier to engage in because it feels like it is something that isn't attainable again mm -hmm. moving away from this all or nothing primitive response to it that it just gradually creates the sum total of something pretty amazing and awesome yeah excellent well good rick i really appreciate your time thank you jane As always, a super thoughtful conversation with Rick. If you'd like more information on Rick and the amazing things that he is doing, all you need to do is go to tappingqnapodcast.com and scroll on down, click on the link for episode 41. If you are listening to this in the website, you will see all of Rick's contact information below. If you're listening in the Tapping Q&A app, just go into the show notes and you can connect to all of Rick's great stuff and content. You'll also notice if you're looking at this in the website below the regular player, there's a link to all of the past interviews that I've done with Rick and they're all the way down at the very bottom below his bio. If you look down there, you'll see I've put a special player in there that only has all of the past episodes that I've done with Rick. So if you want to listen to all of the things that he's done back to back to back, just scroll on down, click play, and it will take care of it for you. If you haven't done so, make sure you sign up for the 10-part guide. Simply go to tappingqna.com. I'll show you in 10 easy steps how you can eliminate self-sabotage using tapping. Don't forget our special 33% off pain relief miracle. Go to tappingqna.com slash pain. It's awesome, awesome stuff. And it kind of smells like cinnamon. So it's not that medicine gross smell sometimes when you have muscle like and you're rubbing something on. This actually smells good and it kind of smells tasty. I like it a lot. Please, please, please go download the app if you haven't done so already. Tapping QA podcast.com. If you know someone out there who would find this interview or any of the interviews helpful, please be our ambassador pass it along. It's absolutely free of charge. Don't spam your inbox. Don't send this to every person in the world. But if you know someone who could use this conversation, please pass it along. The archive is there to be shared far and wide. I was actually having a conversation with a client yesterday and she asked if it was okay if she could use some of the information from one of the podcasts. And she said, oh, I'll give you credit. And I was like, of course, don't even waste time asking me if there's something useful in those podcasts, please use them. Please pass them along. There's over 300 of them there. There's over 100 hours of great, amazing content just waiting for you to go download. You can find us in iTunes. You can find us in Stitcher. You can find us in TuneIn. You can find us in the Google Music Play Store where we are still the number one EFT podcast because we are still the only EFT podcast in the Google Music Play Store. Even though it's called a store, it's absolutely free of charge. Even though you buy stuff in iTunes, it's absolutely free over there as well. Leave us a rating. Leave us a review. It's easier for people to find us. If you have a question, if you have a comment, if you want to send me a knock-knock joke, you can always drop me a note at gene, G-E-N-E, -E, at tappingqna.com. If you're listening to this on the website, just click on the link up above. And if you happen to have the handy-dandy Tapping Q&A app, just click on the menu. Click on Contact. You can send me an email from right inside your smartphone. You can even leave me a voicemail message from right inside the smartphone. I would love to hear from you. Tell me a topic. Tell me someone to interview. We have a lot of great stuff planned for the rest of the fall, but I'm always looking for great ideas. For the Tapping Q&A podcast, this is Gene Montrostelli. I hope you have a great day, and I will talk to you real soon. Bye-bye. 
The Tapping Q&A podcast is copyright Gene Monterostelli, Tapping Q&A 2016. All views expressed by guests are those of the guests and not necessarily of Gene Monterostelli or Tapping Q&A.